Welcome to Railway Legends, Myths, and Stories. I'm Kevin Stanley. Today we start in North America and for the most part in the United States. In this episode, I will talk about rail safety. Through most of the first decades, and some might say the first 100 years of railroading, there was not much apparent thought or anywhere en near enough concern about safety. Early on, the railways were a set of disorganized, mostly independent operations. Slowly, as more and more lines connected up and there was more and more interchange of cars and equipment, one might think that there would be some thought of safety. Well, not actually. Many a railway worried about how well their rail cars were taken care of when running on another road. Rules were most often about the care of equipment, but as to real concern about their workers, well, not so much. The way most railroad cars in North America were connected to each other in the mid-19th century was by the Lincoln pin system. This way of coupling cars together required a worker to stand between the cars as they moved together, while holding a round piece of metal, the link, between the cars and pulling their hand out of the way just as the cars met while dropping a pin into the coupler to hold the link in place. It's no wonder many railway workers were missing fingers. There is more about this safety issue in our video about making a train. Getting a train to stop was another safety worry. For a long time, this was the way braking was done. There is little, to, if anything, safe about this job. Now, while this was supposed to be a funny part of this film, it was way too close to what may have happened. And it shows that this is hard work, but it can be even harder. The operation and safety of braking systems was a grave concern to many people. Unfortunately, not too many of those people were rail executives. The haphazard state of affairs was tolerated for a long time, although there was a growing feeling of public indignation that the railroads were out to maim and kill on purpose. This state of affairs lasted far too long. Eventually, the U.S. government stepped in, and in 1893, the U.S. Congress passed the Safety Appliance Act. While many may not think much of government regulation, this was one time when it was badly needed. I can see where this part may bore some of you, but I think it would be best to start with this act. So here we go with the original act. An act to promote the safety of employees and travelers upon railroads by compelling common carriers engaged in interstate commerce to equip their cars with automatic couplers and continuous brakes and their locomotives and with driving wheel brakes and for other purposes. Whew, that's a mouthful. So here's a summary of the sections of the law. Section 1 required safety checks on locomotives and a sufficient number of cars. Starting on January 1, 1898, it became unlawful for a common carrier used for interstate commerce to use a locomotive engine not equipped with a powered driving wheel brake and appliances for operating the train brake system. It also required that a sufficient number of cars be equipped with power or train brakes so that the engineer in the locomotive could control its speed without requiring brakemen to use a hand brake to do so. Section 2 required automatic couplers that can be coupled and uncoupled without a person going between the cars. Starting on January 1, 1898, common carriers engaged in interstate commerce were prohibited from hauling any car that was not equipped with couplers coupling automatically by impact and that could be coupled without a person going between the ends of the cars. Section 3 required that a railroad could not receive cars that did not meet the standards in the first two sections. 
Section 4 required grab irons. After July 1, 1895, railroads could not use any car in interstate commerce that did not have secure grab irons or handholds in the ends and sides of each car. This provided places for workers to grab hold of the cars when riding on them during switching operations. Section 5 required the American Railway Association, an industry body, to set standard heights for drawbars and other railroad equipment and for the Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate those standards. Starting July 1, 1895, cars that did not meet the regulatory requirement could no longer be used or interchanged with other railroads. Section 6 set a penalty of $100 per violation of the Act. Section 7 allowed the Interstate Commerce Commission to extend deadlines for sufficient reasons. Section 8 dealt with the liability of the railroad in cases where an employee of a non-compliant railroad was injured and put the liability onto the employer, not the employee. Okay, if you want to pause for a bit and go get a snack, I sure can understand. All right, if you are back now, let's look this over. As government acts go, this is pretty straightforward and even makes a fair bit of sense. The first section makes it unlawful, among other things, for a railroad company engaged in interstate commerce within the United States to do business across state lines to run any train without having a sufficient number of cars equipped with train brakes, such as air brakes, although there is nothing that specifies that it has to be air brakes, just some kind of controlling brake system, so that the engineer on the locomotive can control the speed of the train without requiring brakemen to use a handbrake for this purpose. This was to put a stop to brakemen having to run across the tops of the cars. The second section prohibits a carrier from hauling or using on its line in moving interstate traffic any car not equipped with couplers that can be coupled and uncoupled automatically without the necessity of anybody going between the ends of the cars. And the fourth section forbids the use in interstate commerce of any car not provided with secure grab irons or handholds on the ends of the sides of the car for greater security to workers in coupling and uncoupling cars. The sixth section imposes penalties for violating this act. Now let's go back and look over section six first. Note in Section 6 about the penalties, pay a penalty of $100 for each violation. Do not offhand think this is a small fine. Think what you could do with five $20 gold pieces today. $100 in 1893 is about $3,300 today. And while that may not seem like a lot of money for a large entity like a railroad, considering that that penalty could be assessed for every violation, this could potentially mean hundreds or even thousands for non-compliant rail cars. Although for many of the top people in railways at the time, even this was not a lot of money. This was certainly not a sufficient penalty considering what a human life is worth. However, it did help move safety forward. Once this act was the law of the land and it applied to all railways, for the most part, the large railways actually came out the better financially. And why was that? Well, wrecked trains and lost goods are never a way to put money in the bank. As this law applied to all the railways, it was no big disadvantage because it applied equally to all. The aim of safety goes on today. Most recently was the adoption of laws requiring a positive train control system that automatically stops a train that passes a stop signal. And yes, this too is a video for another time. Section 1 turned out to be a big deal to the Westinghouse Brake Company, as at the time the only viable braking system that fit the law was the Westinghouse Air Brake System. Air brakes had already been installed on a fair number of cars, but it still took many more years for them to be in general use. 
As to Section 2, this was going to be, mean big success to Eli Janey of, of Virginia as he had patent number 138405 on the jaw or knuckle coupler. While the Miller coupler had been in use for some time on a large number of passenger cars, its cost was far higher than the Janey coupler. Once some of the bigger railroads adopted the Janey coupler, this tended to make the knuckle coupler an industry standard. There were a number of amendments by a subsequent act in 1903, whose first section provides that the requirements of the original act respecting train brakes, automatic couplers, and grab irons shall be held to apply to all trains and cars used on any railroad engaged in interstate commerce, unless a minor exception was satisfied. By its second section, this act required that not less than 50% of the cars in a train shall have their train brakes used and operated by the engineer on the locomotive, and this conferred upon the Interstate Commerce Commission the authority to increase the minimum percentage to the end that the objects intended may be more fully accomplished. By an order promulgated on the 6th of June, 1910, the Commission increased the minimum number of cars over which the engineer had brake control from 50% of the cars to 85%. The requirement of additional equipment, including ladders, sill steps, and handbrakes, came from a 1910 legislative amendment. Slowly, there had been something of a change in that now there was some concern for the safety of both the traveling public and of the railroad workers. It seems that it takes losing far too many lives to get some people to wake up to safety. Worse is that there had always been ample evidence that a safer railway was a more profitable one. For some in a management position, there seems an unwillingness to ever spend money even when it often makes more money in the long run. We hope this has enlightened you to some of the reasons behind the ways trains are made and operated. Our family takes the train whenever we can. We think it's the safest way to travel. Besides, it's a lot of fun. And as always, we'll see you on the train, the best way to get there.